to come up with a uh, way ahead. Because there's a certain there's a certain amount that they can rebuild for, you know, with the cabinets and uh, countertops. And if they want to, you know, do any upgrades, they have to negotiate that. Okay. Okay. Well, good. Keep them in our prayers. Wow. Yeah. Thank you very much. Amazing what a lightning storm can do to change your life. Yeah. Well, we sure enjoyed our time in Wisconsin and Minnesota last couple of weeks. Well, good. <laughs> um, send some of that weather down. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The cool weather was really, really nice. Yeah, we still fly in November. <laughs> good morning, Jim Spear. How are you doing? Sorry to hear about Tim and his uh, COVID diagnosis. And this morning, Laverne tells me, Laverne Pate tells me that uh, Marvelin, Mar Marilyn Yoder, who uh, flies a lot of cakes and pies for us um, from the Mennonite community, she has COVID, and a, a good portion of the Mennonite community has it. So, uh, big Mennonite community in Montezuma and Oglethorpe nearby. Oh, okay. Uh, and Oglethorpe was a... Lutheran community. Yeah. Um, that, that guy was Lutheran coming over in the 1700s, I think. And so there's a little Lutheran church down there, ELCA. But, uh, and welcome to all of you who join us online here. We're just uh, waiting to start another couple minutes. So, and uh, happy 80th birthday coming up this week, Harry. Yeah. So the birthday party of 500 people is canceled, huh? Yeah, we canceled. <laughs> <laughs> and congrats, Dan and Lori, on the new grandchild. That's wonderful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's your family. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, that was yesterday. 39. Yeah, we're just newbies at this marriage stuff. <laughs> Still trying to figure it out. <laughs> when, yeah, when we, yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, Harry and Peggy could give us all lessons on that. How many years have you been married now? Four. Oh, yeah. Wow. Pretty good. 54 years they've been married. Good morning, Sandy Tracy from Ohio. Glad you can join us this morning. Yeah, so I guess it's about that time to get started. Is that correct? That we're after uh, 9:31. Yeah. Um, so good to have you here. And um, yeah, we just we've had a lot of uh, COVID cases. Um, you know, people who had contact and people who have it now, and it just seems like a lot more widespread. Uh, than it once was, so pray that uh, you know, all the spike will go away with some time. Um, so our psalm this morning is Psalm 109, and anyone who's joining us, if you ever want our workbook page that goes along with us, feel free to send an email to ChristLutheranPerry at gmail.com. That's ChristLutheranPerry, P-E-R-R-Y, at gmail.com, and we will send you Get you on an email list where we send out uh, a Bible study sheet on Sunday mornings. Wish I could get that done earlier, but it seems like I'm always working on it yet on Sunday morning. Um, so that's what we're taking a look at Psalm 109 this morning. So let's open with the word of prayer. Anybody we need to keep in our prayers that you know of? Yeah, Eldora's sister passed away yesterday evening in Ohio, and I think she's still in Ohio. Uh, and all those folks dealing with COVID now. So let's say a word of prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word and promises. And, uh, you know, in a world where there's a lot of question marks as to what the future holds with this whole COVID thing, we give you thanks for the solid rock that you are. We, you know, we have some uh, good answers for the big questions in life that we're loved and forgiven by you and that you're not going to leave us or forsake us in our time of need. So be with Eldora. Uh, we thank you for Tanner's uh, new baby, uh, born to he and his wife uh, this last week. Uh, watch over all those who are uh, being treated for illness and in rehab. And uh, now be with us as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. 
Hey, good morning, Calls. Good to have you here. Oh, and even Nick is going to be here. All right. Good to have you with us. Um, so we're studying Psalm 109 and a little prelude to that. So is everything in the Bible easy to understand? No, no there are some hard things in the, the Bible. And in fact, in 2 Peter 3, 15 to 17, this is what Peter says about the Apostle Paul's writing. And what does he say? Uh, anyone have that one in their Bible? 2 Peter 3, 15 to 17. Anyone have that? 2 Peter 3, 15 to 17. Rob? Everyone who takes a brother is a murderer and a Uh Nope, I don't know. That doesn't uh, sound right. 2 uh, okay. Peter? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but anybody who hates his brother is a murderer. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> So Paul writes some things that are hard to understand. And Peter says, watch out so you don't get carried away with things you don't understand and lose your own stability, lose your own faith. So there's some kind of warning signs with us in regard to Scripture that we uh, just don't, you know, uh, things we don't understand. We say, okay, well, I'm not going to believe the Bible then because I can't grasp that. Um so can you think of some things in the Bible that you've always thought, I don't understand this, I, I don't get this. What, what are some things in Scripture that are hard to understand? Think of any? Any stories? Or kids? Can you think of anything in the Bible, any questions in the Bible that you've always wondered about? You know? <laughs> they, they know better than we do. <laughs> Don't use grace to, as a liberty to do whatever you want. Okay. They're going to be hard things in Scripture, difficult things to understand. Well, I mean, even Christ is risen, and we believe in faith, but it's really hard to. Think of somebody who died for, <laughs> in the grave for three days. Okay. Yeah. Yep, well, exactly. You know, one, one that I've always not understood Exodus 24 9 to 11 it says Moses and the 70 elders went up to Mount Sinai and what did they do they saw God and they ate and they drank with him but then in another place in scripture it says no one has ever seen God and can live so you wonder okay what what was going on there that it says in Exodus, they saw God and they even ate and drank with him. Now, what kind of foods did God eat up there on that mountain, Mount Sinai? So that, that's a challenging one. Uh, or or uh, often in the New Testament, you know, Jesus would do miracles and people even come to faith. And, and what did he tell some of those people after they came to faith? Don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ. Yeah. So what was his reason behind that? to say uh, to somebody who believed in him, now don't tell anyone else. And often, those people seem to go out and tell other people. <laughs> um, and I guess so the explanation for that sometimes is uh, people really weren't going to understand who Jesus was until he died and rose again. You know, uh, they didn't get a, want to get a picture of, good morning, Gillies, glad you could join us in worship this morning, due to Bible study this morning. Yeah, think of any other hard things to understand in scriptures. There are whole books written about the difficulties of the Bible and questions about the internet's great in that regard, and there's a lot of people out there giving pretty good answers to some of these questions. The sun standing still is kind of hard for me. The sun standing still, yeah. For a battle that in the, in that battle, you're right. That's an amazing miracle that God had. So yeah, there's difficulties in scripture, and sometimes we have to answer to people, 
you know, really don't know the answer to that one. You know, Paul mentions that there was a baptism for the dead. We have no clue what he's talking about. Uh, the Mormons do practice a baptism for the dead, but you know, we we've, we've never gone in. There's no other mentions outside of that one. So there's hard things to understand in the scripture. So I mentioned that because this psalm is a hard thing to understand that we're tackling today. When you look through it, you're going to say, whoa, what was David talking about here? Um, somebody could throw this in the face of a Christian and say, is this what you believe? Because uh, it is a difficult psalm to understand. So this is called an imprecatory psalm. And uh, David is calling for the judgment of his enemies 30 times in this psalm. Um, and there's some pretty challenging judgments that he asked to, to come down upon those that are his enemy. Um, so, yeah, imprecatory means to invoke judgment or calamity or curses. And uh, let's just read the, through the psalm and... You'll see what I'm talking about. So we, we wanted to cover one of these imprecatory psalms. Um, so this is kind of a long one. Anybody anybody feel like reading up here today and giving these people a break from my face? Anybody? <laughs> Peggy got it once. Anybody? Anybody? How many of you know how to read? <laughs> <laughs> you want to do it, Okay, I've got the Bible up here. If you've got the right glasses on, this isn't the this is Psalm one. It is kind of a long one. Yeah. Psalm what? One Psalm one hundred nine. Yeah, there's about thirty verses there. Right there. Okay, you're gonna have to suffer with me, guys. <laughs> Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are open against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. Anoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any to pity his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let him be before the Lord continually that he may be cut off, may, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. For he did not remember to show kindness, but pursued the poor and needy and the brokenhearted to put them to death. He loved to curse, let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing, may it be far from him. He clothed himself with cursing as his coat. May it soak into his body like water, like oil into his bones. May it be like a garment that he wraps up around him like a belt that he puts on every day. May this be the reward of my accusers from the Lord, of those who seek evil, speak evil against my life. But you, O God, my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake, because your steadfast love is good, deliver me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is stricken within me. I am gone like a rainbow, like a, like a shadow <laughs> at evening. I am... Shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting. My body has become gaunt with no fat. I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. Help me, O Lord my God. Save me from according to your steadfast love. Let them know that this is your hand. You, O Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you will bless. They arise and are put to shame, but your servant will be glad. May my accusers be clothed with dishonor. May they be wrapped in their <clears throat> in their own shame as a cloak, as in a cloak. With my mouth I will give 
great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng. For he stands at the right hand of the needy one to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. So, what are some of the hard words there of that psalm? <laughs> it's a prayer. What's David praying? Yeah. Yeah, may your uh, wife become a widow and your children be fatherless. Yeah, so basically he's praying for what? That the guy be dead. Yeah, praying for his death. Yeah, your wife's going to become a widow. Yeah, some really hard words. So what do you do with this? So you're on the committee uh, putting our hymnal together. And you can only include so many psalms. There's a psalm like this in Psalm 69. And there's this one, 109. Would you include this in the hymnal or not? Not too much. Yeah. 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 How do you put those two together? Jesus says, love your enemies and goes beyond. What do you do for those who persecute you? Pray for those who persecute you. So how do you put that together with, with this? So what do you think they did in her hymnal with Psalm 109 and Psalm 69? Think they included it or not? No, they want to wipe out the poor from the earth. Some, some do, yeah. They, they didn't include these in our hymn book. <laughs> um, so how do we explain this psalm what, what, what would be your explanation behind this and should uh, you know those psalms are in our our hymnal so we can sing them should we sing this psalm is there anybody who does sing this psalm what group does yet today the Jews yeah they sing all the psalms that's their hymn book so they sing this one as well. As well. Um, so they are still using it today. And uh, yeah, this is kind of a tough one. And we, we, we have uh, no difficulties talking about how God is loving and merciful and kind. But when it comes to justice, that kind of grates us. That's a hard one for us sometimes to wrap our minds about, about how God punishes sin and sinners as well. Um, so how about how might some explain away this psalm in wrong ways? Might be what well, might be some wrong ways of looking at this psalm. God is love. Okay, so this some might say this should not belong in scripture. You know, this was not inspired by God. All right. Um, some and, might say this isn't really yeah exactly that, but this is David's own personal. Yeah, so I might go about it that way. So this is an example of a sinful man who's going about prayer the wrong way. So that's an explanation. All right. Uh, well, we're going to take a look at this and see if we can, you know, figure out what David's talking about here. So there's a few other examples of imprecatory verses in Scripture. In fact, uh, there's quite a few Psalms that have words like this. In fact, I think there's about 25. In precatory psalms that have portions of verses, but the big ones are Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. We're doing one of the two, just so we have a picture of how do you explain this to somebody who's outside the faith or somebody who's a fellow Christian? You know, how do we, what do we do with these words? So let me, let's assign a few of these here. Numbers 10, 35. Renee's got that one. Second Kings 2, 23 and 24. Joe. Uh, Psalm 69, 27, and 28. Okay. Janae. Psalm 139, 19 to 22. This is a beautiful psalm, Psalm 139. And then in the middle of it, you get these ugly verses. <laughs> Susan, and uh, if you want to take uh, Jeremiah, then Michael. So, um, yeah, and if you even want to summarize what you're saying, that's okay, too. You can read it or summarize. So, first one, Numbers 10, 35. These are the words that... Moses prayed every time the Ark of the Covenant was moved. Whenever the Ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. Yeah, so let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate uh, hate you flee before you. 
Those are Moses' words when the Ark of the Covenant got moved. All right? Um, so kind of uh, get rid of those people who are in the way. 2 Kings 2, 23, 20. This is an interesting one, Joe. Okay, this is uh, concerning Elijah. Yeah. He went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the waves, a small voice came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. I think it's getting kind of personal here. <laughs> and, uh, and he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she bears came out of the woods and tore a horse to the Lord. <laughs> You're not going to hear that story in Sunday school. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he curses them, and two she bears come out of the woods, and um, all, it doesn't say it killed them, but tore 42 of the boys. So uh, all for making fun of baldness. All right. Uh, for Psalm 69, 27 and 28. Add, them, add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out. Of the book of the living, let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Yeah, so David, I think, wrote that psalm too. Yeah, let them be blotted out from the book of life, or the book of the living. And he's praying that, you know, don't let them go to go into heaven. Uh, he's praying there. This is examples of what's called imprecatory psalm. Psalm 139, and again, this is a wonderful psalm that we use for pro life. It talks about, you know, God formed you in the womb. But then uh, these verses in, in the middle of it, kind of. Psalm 139. Well, that you would slay the wicked, O God, O men of flesh, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And I, do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I come from my enemies. Yeah, so... God, I hate the people who hate you. Um, and then Jeremiah 18, 19 to 23. One last one. Michael had that one. Hear me, hear me O Lord, and listen to the voice of what happened to me. This is the good news that you made to me. Yet they have dug a pit in my life. Remember how I stood before you, speaking your name. Turn away your wrath from me. Therefore, deliver up the children of the men. Give them over the power of the sword. Let their wives become childless in the land. May their men be death by pestilence. Their youth be struck down by the sword of battle. May a cry be heard from their houses and be raised and plunderer suddenly upon them. For they have dug a pit to take me and laid snares for my feet. Yet you, O Lord, know all their plotting. Give not their iniquity, nor blot out their sin from your sight. Let them be overthrown before you. Deal with them in the time of their end. Okay, so again, here's another prayer. Let the women become widows. Let the children be slain by the sword. This is Jeremiah 18, 19 to 23. Kind of really harsh words, you know, that are spoken there uh, by Jeremiah. Um, and uh, so then we put that together. So these are kind of tough things to study and even hear for us. Put that together with 2 Timothy 3.16, which as blank scripture is breathed out by God, what's that first word? All. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. So what does that say about this Psalm 109? Was this supposed to? Yeah, there's something here for us to learn. It's supposed to be profitable for us. You know, it's all placed here by God. And did Jesus believe that the Psalms were inspired by God? Yeah, in fact, this next verse, Luke 24, 44, then Jesus said to them, hey, these are my words that I spoke to you. This is uh, on the road to Emmaus while I was still with you, that everything was written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Psalms. They must be fulfilled. So Jesus believed in the Psalms. And Paul believes in the Psalms. It says, you know, God inspired this. And there's something in here that's profitable for us. So what is profitable about this? What is there that could be profitable for us about these words of judgment against enemies? All right. Um, yeah. And so some might say, hey, this doesn't belong in Scripture. 
there is actually some, you know, good theologians who kind of feel like, uh, you know, David is just out of line to speak this. Uh, I don't know if I go that far, but uh, there are some who feel that way. So let's go into the verses here. So David, uh, verses one through five. So David's enemies have what kind of tongues? Lying tongues and words of hate. Yeah, lying tongues and words of hate. And we have another word for this. We'd call it what kind of assassination? Character assassination. Yeah. And where, where do we see that in our world today? Character assassination. Where don't we see it? <laughs> where we don't we see it? Yeah. Pretty prevalent where? You know, yeah, this word kind of came from 1930s in the campaigns of that year. Character assassination. Because people were starting to try to tear down the character of the people who were running for office that particular year. So, uh... So how, how could we be guilty of character assassination? What kind of things uh, might we be guilty of sometimes that are along these same lines? Repeating some of the same things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, gossip, you know, kind of maybe exaggerating a little bit something somebody did or said or doing so-called half-truths, which I don't know if that's even a word, half truth. What is that? Uh, yeah, so exaggerating after, you know, defamation, scandal. Um, yeah, we, we just have to watch our mouths, don't we? Because it's so easy for us to pass along something that others like to hear because it's juicy, but it's not building up. But what does what uh, Luther say in our catechism that our words should do when it comes to other people? Build up. Yeah, build up, put the best construction on everything. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're to build up our neighbor with our words rather than tear them down. And yeah, we just have lots of bad examples on TV of all the candidates, you know, tearing into each other. And uh, people who are narcissists, kind of me, 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 they're often known, known for this. They just tear everybody else around, down. You know, why? That. Get yourself up on the mountain by tearing everybody else down. So, uh, yeah, character assassination. But David's response, look at verse 4. What's his response? He shows love and he gives himself to prayer. Yep. So we could say in some ways David's following Jesus' call to love your, your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But... Was that action by David successful? Did it seem to be having any uh, success towards his enemies? Didn't seem to be. You know, it didn't seem to be. And in fact, in verse 5, it says, yeah, so they reward me evil for good. You know, David's praying for them. He's trying to love them. But they're just heaping on the, the bad words. So... There's no physical things going on here. It's all words. And how damaging can words be? Can't you get over it? Yeah. Damaging words can be hurtful, can't they? Well, that goes in your brain. Yeah, it goes in your brain. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, words can do a lot of damage. And so we just need to watch our words. And, you know, James has a lot of uh, words about it being like a flaming, uh, you know, fire, you know, our tongue can be. Yeah, so what sin against God finds us displaying evil in return for his good? It's interesting. And uh, as Judgment Day comes closer, uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 2, watch out for people who are un yeah, ungrateful, unthankful. And so there's a lot of sin that's returning evil for evil. So Heidi hits me and I hit her back. You know, that's returning evil for evil. But what's unthankfulness? God gives us things. And what do we do? We don't, yeah, we're ungrateful for it. God, you deserve me more. You know, it's, that's returning evil for good. And thankfulness is returning evil for good. It's a whole different level of evil when it comes right down to it. All right. So when you look at David's life, so he had friends, 
He also had enemies. And how did David normally treat his enemies? Saul? Yeah, how did he treat Saul? Well, how did Saul treat David? Yeah, by how? How did he try to kill him? Uh, what an axe, but... Yeah, spear. Threw a spear at him while, you know, he's playing on his lyre to Saul. And a couple times tried to throw a spear at him and kill him. And on one occasion, he's running from Saul. He knows Saul is kind of camping down in the valley. You know, he's sleeping outdoors. And uh, what does David do? He walks into the camp right up to Saul. And he has the opportunity to kill him. And what does he do? He just takes a piece off of his robe. And the next morning when Saul gets up, what does David say? Hey, hey Saul, look what I got here. You know, who killed you? Here's a piece of your robe. And, and I did. And, and then basically that's kind of how David dealt with Saul, you know, for many, many years. Um, there's another story. 2 Samuel 16, 5 to 11. This one's worth reading. Another guy, it wasn't Saul, but it starts with S. Someone mind reading 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 16, 5 to 11? It's a good lesson on what do you do with someone who's cursing you, make fun of you, you know, uh, really throwing bad words at you. What do you do with those people? 2 Samuel 16, 5 to 11. Who is this person? Anybody got that one to read out loud? Okay, Lori? Shimai. <laughs> okay. Um, when King David came to Bethlehem, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was I, the son of Jera, and as he came to church on him, him came to church. And he preached unto David and all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men were on him, right? Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged you on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, you, your evil is on you, for you're, you are a man of blood. Yeah, that, that's pretty good. So here's this guy comes along. David's having to leave town because his son is threatening the throne. And as he's leaving town, this guy Shimei comes along. Not only curses David, but also does what? Throws stones at him. Yeah, and one of David's companions says, why don't you go take his head off? And David says, no, maybe the Lord put him there to curse me. Isn't that a unique response? And David just lets him go. You know, lets this guy throw stones at the king. I'm sure he could have had lots of soldiers go in and do something. So, uh, but that kind of gives you a little picture of David's heart normally. I mean, there's times he did judgment too. Goliath, what did he do with Goliath? Yeah, he did him in, yeah, and cut off his head, right. Um, so, in this psalm, does David claim that he's innocent of all sin in his life? No, yeah, and in fact, many of the psalms, he lays out that, you know, I know my sin is always before me. Psalm 51 is a good example. So is it possible that David is innocent when it comes to the charge of his accusers in this particular psalm? Is that a possibility? That they're just making false accusations? We'd have to say, yeah, you know, that's a possibility that, you know, okay, so we're not innocent of all wrongdoing, but we might be innocent of the charge somebody makes against us in life. And uh, so we can proclaim our innocence. I don't know if you, if you remember, there's some false claims of innocence too. It was 1997, and Robert Schuler of the Crystal Cathedral got in a tussle with a airline steward on a plane over his cheese snack that, that was being brought to him. <laughs> they only had cheese and fruit together, and he wanted only cheese. Um, 
<laughs> after doing an interview over this, and it didn't go to court or anything, Robert Shuler said, I have not broken one of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> we, we probably don't want to come up with a statement like that. <laughs> yeah, he might have said I'm, I was innocent of this charge that this person is making against me, but to say I haven't broken one of the Ten Commandments, that, now that's going a little bit too far. Uh, and of course, I've made it in the press as well. So, um, yeah, David's kind of claiming his innocence uh, in these charges. And then let's go to verses 6 to 20. And notice how things kind of change. In verses 1 to 5, he's talking in the plural. But now 6 to 20, what are all the pronouns? Yeah, singular. Him, him, him. So who do you think the him is? Who do you think David's talking about here? Why didn't he name him? We have no clue who it is. Yeah. Is it Saul? Is it somebody else? No, I think sometimes the Psalms leave those names out so we can apply them in life to anybody you know, who might be doing this. So it's an individual that he's uh, bringing up this charge against, not just a whole group of people. And it's interesting that in verse 8, may his days be few, may another take his office. Who did the disciples, the apostles, later apply that verse to? Judas. Judas. Yeah. When they went to elect a new apostle, they said, ah, the, the psalmist, you know, wrote about uh, Judas. May his days be few. And he committed suicide. And uh, may another take his place. And so they elected uh, someone to take his place. Um, so I think we wrote this one already. And in verse 9, the wife of David's enemy would become a widow. And the children of David's enemy become fatherless. It is basically a prayer for the death of his enemy. Yeah, that's what he's praying for. He's praying that his wife becomes a widow. Um, but, it, but it's interesting. God promises this same punishment. We read this verse two weeks ago, Exodus 22. He promises the same punishment that your women are going to become widows, your children to become orphans. If you mistreat who? The widows and the orphans. Yeah. If you mistreat widows and orphans, I'm going to make your women become widows and your children become orphans. That's from God's hand. You know, that's his threat that he makes. So this, this is not a new threat from Scripture. David's kind of repeating something that is already there in the pages of Scripture. All right. Now let's take a look real quickly. If you don't mind turning to Deuteronomy 28, I think this gives a little bit of context to these imprecatory psalms and how David might have been interpreting them. We're not going to read this whole thing, but if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, and who's speaking these words in Deuteronomy? Yeah, they're through Moses. God is kind of giving him the words. And uh, if you look at the heading in verses 1 through 14, what's that whole section talking about? If you obey me, yeah, you're going to get some blessings. And what are some of the blessings God mentions that you're going to get if you just are obedient to me? Yeah, your fields, your cities. Yep. Your children. Yep. Your orchards. Okay. Your livestock. Um, take a look at verse 12. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. It used to be that the United States lent to many nations, but did not borrow. When did that change? You know what year that changed? 1973. Isn't that interesting? What else happened in 1973? <coughs> Roe versus Wade. Yeah. That was the year we had money to give out and we didn't borrow, but now we borrow. And who's financing a good portion of that debt? China. Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? Communist nation who's tearing down churches, buying into our debt. Um, so we have that in verses 1 to 14, all these blessings. How about verses 15 to the end? 
Yeah, curses for disobedient. And what, what does God say is going to happen to those who are disobedient or disavow him? Well, yeah, yeah, kind of the opposite of everything. Your fields aren't going to do well. Your children aren't going to do well. You're going to get disease, wasting disease. You know, someone pointed that verse 22 and said, yeah, look what happens to nations who <laughs> depart from God. Um, so in a way, in this psalm and in the imprecatory psalms, whose words are, are David repeating? Where did he find some of these words? Yeah, Deuteronomy. I mean, in a way, he, he is just repeating some of the things that God said. Um, so let's go to, go to verses. Uh, oh, we've got a couple more here. So revenge. You know, is, is David asking for revenge or is he asking for retribution? You know, the definition for re revenge is retaliation. That's okay. You did something to me, so I'm coming back at you. And often we go above what we've suffered. So revenge and retaliation kind of go together. But retribution, we're just asking that the wicked be judged. You know, put the murderer in prison. Put the thief behind bars so he doesn't steal anymore. Uh, we're just giving, say, give them reward for what they're due. You know, they robbed the bank, so they need to be put away for a while. They don't do it again. Um, so what's David seeking? Is he seeking revenge or is he seeking retribution? Is he seeking justice? Yeah. Normally, if you're re seeking, seeking retaliation, who does retaliation normally? The person does, right? Yeah. Does David say, I'm going to go out and kill these guys? I'm going to make their women widows? Does he say that? Who, who's he putting it in the hands of? He's leaving it in the hands of God. I mean, get, let's give him credit. He's not taking it in his own hands. He said, God, you know, you're God of justice. You judge these people who've done evil. All right? So uh, I think he's, he's looking for, you know, the retribution, the justice. Um, so David's request for relief. Um, we always put these definitions here. Mercy, what's the defini de definition of mercy? It's... Not receiving what we deserve, while grace is receiving what we do not, not deserve. Yeah, kind of a little different tinge there. You know, mercy is not receiving what we deserve. We deserve punishment, but God doesn't give it to us. That's mercy. Grace, we're getting a gift that we don't deserve. We haven't earned it. All right. And then uh, verses 23 to 25. So. David's physical condition is affected by these words. So in verse 22, what's being stricken there? His heart, right. 24a, my knees are weak. And 24b, we would love to be in this situation, most of us. Yeah, my body has no fat. All right. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. You know, when people are hurting in the Bible, what does God often supply them with? Food. Yeah, isn't that interesting? That when we're hurting, when we're in grief, when we're in pain, sometimes our body kind of gets neglected. And, you know, God fed Elijah when he's out there in the desert. Brought him angel food cake. Um, so the Lord takes care of people. Yeah, by an angel and brought him a cake. Um so, uh, yeah, his body's wasting away in the midst of all this. And it happened with Job, too. In verse 25, Job's friends kind of wagged their heads at him like they, David's friends wagged or his enemies wagged their heads at him. And I think it's often because people think, okay, you're having a bad way because you have done something wrong. You sinned. That's why you have COVID. You obviously weren't taking care of yourself. Uh, you have cancer because you weren't eating right. You were saying, um, and we just have to watch out that we don't pass those kind of judgments upon people. Um, they're sin in this broken world, and all kinds of bad things happen. And it's not necessarily because someone is sin. Can happen, but it doesn't always. And um, God doesn't act that way, so God acts and saves according to His steadfast love. 
and often that's that word is translated actually mercy in the Bible. You know, I think in our newer versions they translate mercy as steadfast love. Um, and David says, "Hey, when I'm delivered, I'm going to give thanks." Where in the midst of the throng, yeah, midst of the congregation, depending on your words. So it says, "I'm going to give thanks in church uh, when I'm delivered from all this." So what are we doing here this morning for worship? You know, we're giving thanks to God in the midst of other people. That's a good place to give thanks to God. Not just in our closet, not just a personal faith, but God puts us in communities of believers. All right? So kind of conclusions here and wrap-ups. You know, I think it's difficult to judge David's word because we don't know exactly what he was going through. I mean, people were very... challenging to one another to put it lightly um, I mean even even some of the kings who conquered other kings they would put those kings under their table in pits and uh, let those kings eat with their fingers cut off the bread that fell from the table um, and that was just kind of a show of force you know I conquered these kings now look they're down there in the pit underneath my table um, we don't know what kind of things were going on in David's life. So, you know, for somebody who's in a prison in North Korea, maybe having to watch his family suffer, his wife and children suffer as a re result of his Christian faith, can you pray something like this? Boy, it's hard for us to say that, but we're not in their shoes. And I, I think we want to be careful about passing harsh judgment here about a situation we don't know. And uh, verse two, or number two there, David asked who to take action against the evildoers. Yeah, he's asking God to do it, not himself, right? And he's asking God to do it on the basis of his promises in Deuteronomy 28, that, hey, God, you promised this, not me. Um, and while the prayers of David are severe, his personal actions in Scripture were pretty gracious. And finally, you know, whenever we do have judgment and discipline, even in a church, you know, the purpose really is restoration. We're trying to bring somebody around to faith. So even in the church when, you know, we're having to discipline someone, I mean, the purpose is to get them to repent of their sins and bring them back to the Christian faith. So, um, yeah, I put a few down here, and now we're getting near the end of time. So what does the saying mean? A church that cannot curse, neither can it bless. What does that mean? They're qualities of God, right? And the easy one to talk about is, yeah, his mercy, his grace. But there's another another quality of God called, yeah, justice, judgment. That's a quality of God, too. And we, we have to include both of those. You know, we can't just talk about, oh, Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. Savior from what? You never talk about sin. What do I need a Savior? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Be lost in hell. I mean, those are not just sins going to hell. Those are sinners going to hell. Right. Um, so what might be learned from singing or saying this song? Well, we might be reminded that God does judge sinners. Um, I mean, we, we're used to saying the same. You know, God judges the sin, but he loves the sinner. Well, in finality, you know, on Judgment Day, he's going to judge sinners, too. There's some truth in that, but there's also some falsehood in that. And then finally, who did the judgment for all sin ultimately fall upon? And yeah, that's, that's where it really came down to. You know, he took all the judgment upon himself for the sins of the whole world. All right? So John 3.18, whoever believes in me will not be condemned. You know, great words. All right, that was a lot. We're over time. Uh, I think we're doing some one next week. I'll have to look myself. <laughs> Let's say a word of prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words, even the hard words of Scripture. And uh, help us to re remind ourselves that, you know, all Scripture is there, uh, that we might be led to, to understand uh, more greatly um, your characteristics and that we might receive a profitable teaching, even from these hard verses in this particular psalm. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
And thanks to everyone online who joined us here this morning for Psalm 1 and I. Glad you could be with us. Have a blessed day. Thanks, Gillies. Good to have you with us.